So as Jenny mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits of poultry litter in crop production. And I'm really glad that Jenny kind of cued me in the way she did because I, I was going to um, kind of introduce this talk in a similar way. I don't know that there is too much in this talk that's really going to be totally brand new to anyone, right? Some of you guys who have been using poultry litter for, for a long time really probably could get up here and give this talk better than I can. But I think what's important um, is sharing with you guys the message that I'm sharing across the state when I give a talk like this. So I was out um, in Western Maryland. They requested me to come out and give this talk and it was, um, it was good to share what I'm about to share with you guys, the benefits of using poultry litter to a no, new audience that could potentially be um, an outlet as the state kind of moves forward with uh, moving some of this poultry litter to other areas of the state. So um, just because I said you're not going to learn anything new doesn't mean everybody can snooze on me. I'm sure you're going to get something interesting out of this talk. But but I think more of the message is that you know this is kind of what the university and Maryland Department of Agriculture kind of together having the same message is kind of sharing across the state. And, and I think that's important, and I think that's why um, Jenny really invited me here to talk today. All right, so why am I giving this talk? Why do we care? Why are we moving poultry litter around? Why are we doing anything different than we've been previously doing before, right? Well, because there's obviously an issue somewhere, okay? So... Let's focus in, let's zoom in a little bit on the Eastern Shore. We are a major area of the state where we have a lot of agriculture production, specifically a very concentrated area of poultry production. Now I love this image. When I taught animal science, I would show this image. I stole it right from our animal science textbook. All right. Not only are we an extremely concentrated area of poultry production just within the state of Maryland, but when we look nationally across the whole country, and, and the more I look at this map I was I was studying a, a little more last night as I was kind of prepping and I don't know that it's fully like to scale like I don't know that it's a totally accurate map to scale because I think the Delmarva looks a little big but it's amazing to see those number those dots there so each one of these dots like it may be a little hard to see in the back but like there's just one dot right there in that one county all right that's a million broilers we're talking meat chickens broiler chickens all right. Look at how swamped. I mean, there's dot upon dot upon dot upon dot just in our little Delmarva Peninsula. All right. So when I when I say, yeah, we're, we're a concentrated area, I think we get kind of used to that. Right. This is our norm. We know what, what our landscape looks like when we look nationally across the country. Holy moly. This is a tiny little small area. And we've got a lot of birds that are producing a lot of manure. OK. So. We generate poultry litter, and as most of you know, this is a mixture not only of just manure, it's a mixture of bedding, typically kind of a wood product, all right? And, and really, at the end of the day, when we think about growing chickens, this is a byproduct. No one is growing chickens to produce manure. We're growing chickens to produce meat, all right? So this is a byproduct of an industry that we now have to figure out how we're going to manage and how we're going to deal with. All right. So previously, you know, before I think people started realizing the benefits of poultry litter, it was like, yeah, let's just spread it out on that field so we can get rid of it. Right. At, at one point, it was thought of as waste. Jenny told me not to say it's waste. I'm all, I'm saying this in a historical term. I will not refer to it as waste moving forward. But but I mean, at one point, that was the thought. Right. This is a byproduct. We're trying to produce these chickens. We've got all this stuff. What are we going to do with it? It's a waste product. We're going to get rid of it. All right. That's what they seem to do with every waste product. Right. Let's just spread it on the land and see what happens. The soil will take care of it. All right. But I think now, especially as we're learning more about nutrient management and soils and, and literally managing our nutrients in our environmental systems, I think we are really definitely publicly recognizing that um, poultry litter really has value as fertilizer on agriculture land. So we shouldn't be thinking about this as waste disposal mode. We should be thinking about this as there's value in this product and we're going to be using it as a fertilizer, just as if you were going to go purchase synthetic fertilizer. So I won't call it waste again, Jenny. <laughs> All right, so I want to take a look at, you know, actually break it down and let's compare poultry litter 
to some of the other available um, kind of amendments, we could call it, all right? So I stole this table right from my, my soils textbook. So the numbers might not be perfect, but I think they make the point that I am trying to make. So um, you'll see on the table here, we've got poultry uh, manure up top, and I have the blue bar just so everyone can kind of pay attention to it. And we're just gonna kind of compare down the table. We're gonna compare to sewage sludge, um, sheep manure, legume hay, uh, swine manure, even some kind of green manure, right? Tilling under our, our, our cover crops, all right? So let's go through this uh, column by column. We'll go through it together nice and slow. All right, so poultry litter. First column is that water content. All right, so we'll notice that poultry litter has really low water content, which is good, especially as we're talking about moving this material around the state to different places, right? We don't wanna just be shuttling water around, all right? So a very low water content makes it much easier to transport um, this type of amendment, all right? High nitrogen content, I don't know if you can see the numbers uh, very well because of what's on the background, but the poultry manure has the highest, end, well, almost the highest end content, all right? Most of these guys down here are, are down in the twos, all right? So we're getting a lot of bang for our buck. We're not moving a lot of water around. We're moving solid material, and it's got a pretty high nitrogen content. There's value there in that nitrogen, all right? Now, we can argue all day long about having a high P content, whether that's good or bad, all right? I don't work with phosphorus anymore, so I don't have to have that argument with you guys, all right? But if we're looking at this from a fertilizer value, value of this material as fertilizer, all right, poultry manure has a pretty high phosphorus content. Again, we're not moving a lot of water around. We're going to find that phosphorus in the solid parts, the solid material. And that's why we're seeing a, a pretty high concentration of that phosphorus in that manure. All right, let's take, I'm not gonna go one by one. I lied, if you thought I was gonna go through all those, nah, we don't got time for that, all right? But a very good source of other micronutrients, and this is very pertinent, and I don't think Rachel's in here, but I spoke to the Queen Anne's County Master Gardeners yesterday, and I do a three hour lecture for them, and we talk about soils and plant nutrition, and I always give them the example of someone's gonna call you at some point, and say they've got like a molybdenum deficiency, right? And they're gonna go, hey, where do I find pure molybdenum? I need to fix this molybdenum deficiency, right? And I think really the issue is not that you need pure molybdenum, get some chicken litter, right? I told them to call Rachel and see if Rachel will give them some poultry litter, mix it into their garden, you should be good, all right? So when we're talking about managing even our micronutrients, all you need is a good source of some uh, manure, especially poultry litter, and you're good. You don't have to worry too much about getting too detailed with managing those individual micronutrients, all right? So I even gave poultry litter credit yesterday to the master gardeners, so there. <laughs> All right, so what does this whole giant table mean? That this is a very cost-effective method for applying nutrients to agriculture fields, not waste disposal. We are applying nutrients and there is value. All right, the nitrogen cycle. I think I showed this one last, I talked about nitrogen last year, right? The folks who were here, I think I did, because I think I only gave one talk last year, which was nitrogen. All right. So let's talk a little about the nitrogen cycle. What I want to focus in, I don't want to go through the whole cycle, that's not the point. What I want you guys to focus in on are our green circles here, all right? These are the different forms of nitrogen that exist in the soil. We're, we're not going to talk about atmospheric nitrogen for right now. We're just talking about the soil, all right? We've got kind of three different forms of nitrogen that exist in the soil, and again, I wanna point out, which I'm sure I did last year, the ammonium and the nitrate, these are the only two forms that have arrows that are going up into the plant, okay? So let's zoom in and let's kinda, kinda break those down a little bit. All right, so the difference between our ammonium and our nitrate that are immediately available to plants and our organic nitrogen is that solubility and that availability, all right? So the ammonium and the nitrate that you potentially add as synthetic commercial fertilizer, those nutrients are immediately available to the plant. They're there in the soil, and as long as there's a little bit of water to carry that nitrogen up to the plant root, it's going to be taken up in the plant. Immediately available, 
all right? And when we look at nitrogen, especially nitrate with its negative charge, all right? Soils have a negative charge and nitrate has a negative charge. Soil doesn't want to hold on to that nitrate, all right? So this, in this inorganic form, nitrate and to an extent ammonium, that's not the way we want to hold on to the nitrogen in our soil because it's not going to stay in our soil. As soon as we get a rain, I don't want to bring up 2018 because it was a, an interesting year, right? As soon as we get a little bit of rain, that nitrogen is gone when it's in that inorganic form, that plant available form, okay? Versus that organic nitrogen that comes from those manures, that comes from your cover crop, that comes from your green manures, all right? This organic nitrogen is not immediately available. And you may think, well, then what's the point, right? I need it now. Yeah, but you also need a long-term storage option. You also need that nitrogen to be available later in the season when that inorganic end that you applied has either leached or has already been used by the plant. All right? So this organic form of nitrogen, it actually has to be broken down by microbes. So when we talk about our living in healthy soils, it's because we've got all those microbes, those fungi, those bacteria, and they're literally breaking down your organic nitrogen and making it available for the plant. All right. So when we talk about poultry litter, and I've heard Jenny refer to this, refer to poultry litter as this before, a long-term storage, a, a long-term organic fertilizer, and, and that's really what it is. Because we're putting that nitrogen down in this organic form that's not immediately available to the plant. So this is really a great option. Using something like poultry litter and other manures is a great option for keeping that nitrogen in your soil. All right. Just an image to kind of show that. All I want you to look at is this line that I've pointed out here. All we're seeing is that over time, as we go through the season, when we're using an organic form of nitrogen, it's really slow release. We don't see a really steep line. It's just slowly over time to that season, our nitrogen level's increasing as that organic nitrogen is being mineralized, being broken down by those microbes. All right, let's talk a little bit about alum-treated poultry litter, all right? So at some point, and I probably should Google the history of this, but um, integrators, growers started treating their poultry litter with aluminum sulfate, and this really wasn't anything, right, again, Manure is just the byproduct, all right? This wasn't to make the manure any better. This was for bird health, all right? To keep down that ammonia concentration in the houses. So changes were made to how we're managing this manure for bird health, but I think we were getting a benefit from, I say we, as in you know users of poultry litter of this manure. There was a benefit in that this aluminum sulfate was binding to some of the phosphorus, making it less soluble, keeping it in the soil, keeping it in the manure longer, decreasing our risk for loss, all right? So when we compare uh, poultry litter nutrient concentration, again, this is just a visual, no numbers, NPK, kind of pre-alum treatment, all right, versus today, we see that we have really just drastically limited that um, available P that could potentially be lost to the environment. All right, what else besides the P? Nobody wants to talk about P. I especially don't want to talk about P anymore. All right, but we're also getting other benefits in terms of our nitrogen and our pH. So if I hadn't just given that Master Gardener's talk yesterday where I lectured on for like 20 minutes about pH, I would have maybe also needed a review on pH. So I, I like to put the image up here so we're, we're all on the same playing field. So when we're talking about pH, neutral's kind of right in the center. When we're talking about acidic pH or the pH value lowering, we're talking about an increase in the concentration of those H plus ions, all right? Versus as our still soil starts getting more alkaline, a higher pH, that's a lower concentration of those H plus ions, all right? And when we talk about nitrogen shifting back and forth from ammonium, which has an extra H, to ammonia, which is a neutral charge, all right? That's where they tend to fall on the pH scale. All right, 
So when we're treating poultry litter with alum, we are lowering the pH inside that poultry litter, all right? Lowering the pH we're just talking about in the poultry litter. Keeping that nitrogen in the ammonium form with that positive charge, all right? That prevents ammonia volatilization. That ammonia just going right off up into the atmosphere. So keeping that nitrogen in the poultry litter that alum is lowering the pH, keeping it in that positively charged form. That's good. We're keeping the nitrogen in the poultry litter. All right? When we use an amendment like poultry litter, so an organic amendment versus something like an ammonium nitrate fertilizer, all right? When we apply ammonium nitrate fertilizer, over time, we are lowering the pH of our soil. All right? When we are using something like alum-treated poultry litter, we're actually slightly increasing our soil pH, all right? Keeping our soil pH in the optimum range for the rest of our nutrients to be available to our plant, as well as potentially, hopefully, decreasing our lime costs that we're going to eventually incur to keep that pH in its optimum range. So killing two birds with one stone, I think. Keeping that nitrogen in your amendment and hopefully decreasing your lime cost and keeping that pH closer in that optimum range. Okay, the other major, and I probably don't have to say this to this group, but the other major benefit of poultry litter is adding this organic matter, all right? Why do we care about organic matter? Why are we obsessed? Well, I don't know obsessed, but why are we interested? Why do we pay attention to our organic matter, right? Organic matter is improving our soil condition. Ability to hold water. Organic matter is like a big black sponge. It holds on to water, all right? It glues together our soil particles and allows water to flow through our soil profile better. Getting that water infiltration, getting it to the plant when it needs it most, all right? Improving that soil structure. Again, gluing together those pieces of soil, getting really nice clods, and really allowing water and nutrients to move through that profile. Conserving water, right? Acting like a black sponge, holding onto that water. If that water is not moving through the profile, you're not losing your nitrogen, so reduces the nitrogen losses. Gives your ecosystem, gives your soil that resilience to drought, okay? If the water's staying on your field and being sucked into your soil, it's not eroding, it's not running off, all right? Finally, that organic matter provides energy for those microbes. Those microbes are so important for releasing that organic N. All right, so you're getting a swath of benefits just by taking that poultry litter, hopefully, off of somebody's hands. All right, and again, that slow release over time of that soluble N. All right, so how did we get to this place where we have an issue with poultry litter and we have to do something to manage it, all right? At some point in the past, poultry litter was applied at really high rates, particularly over on the eastern shore where it was available, all right? Folks were utilizing this, the, were utilizing this poultry litter, this manure, to meet the nitrogen demands of their crops. All right, and a really important caveat that I want to point out, and I, and I thank Jenny for, for pointing this out and reminding me of this. I am in no way insinuating that anyone did anything wrong as we're talking about putting poultry litter out at rates that were high, higher than what we use today, okay? I want to make the point that folks were following the university recommendations that were made at this time. All right, we have learned a lot about utilizing manure, movement of nitrogen, movement of phosphorus in our soils, in our ecosystems over the last 20, 30 years. So my point when I'm saying historically applied at high rates, this isn't malicious and no one was doing anything wrong. We were following the best science that we had available at the time. So I just wanna make that point so that it's not um, seen as in a negative way, all right? Folks were doing the best they could. They were meeting the nitrogen demands of their crop by applying, by applying their poultry litter. So let's take a look. Again, no numbers. I'm just using these colored bars to make a point, all right? Here's the arbitrary requirement of NPK for our corn crop, 
right? And here is the nutrient concentration of the poultry litter that we plan to use, all right? This is in synthetic fertilizer where you can call up your dealer and say, I want exactly this mix, exactly this recipe, and deliver it tomorrow, right? That, that This is not it. You get what you get, and the nutrient content you get in your manure is just what comes out of the house, all right? What comes in on this test. So, if we look really quick, maybe look left, look right, back and forth, hopefully you can make out that what the corn needs to grow and what is available from that poultry litter do not sync up, right? Let's take a look at what's that, what, we look, what that looks like when we overlap those bars. So if we apply enough poultry litter to meet, to match perfectly that nitrogen demand of what the crop needs, well, what does that look like for our other nutrients? Right? We don't care about potassium. Potassium doesn't affect the bay. We don't really worry about that. But look at that amount of phosphorus then that's overapplied, applied well beyond what that crop needs for growth. Right? Again, not malicious. It just happened. We were using this fertilizer to meet the end requirements of our crop, and we ended up putting on more phosphorus than was necessary. Is this OK? Depends, right? If I were given a phosphorus talk, that would be my answer, right? It depends, right? Depends where you are, depends where you're located. You gotta use the P-index or the PMT to decide if that's okay or not, all right? We also had this belief, again, this belief was in the university, in the nutrient management research community, that, you know, our soils have this capacity to hold on to phosphorus, all right? So it's okay to add more, right? If you would have asked this question, is this okay, 30, 40 years ago, the answer would have been like, yeah, go ahead, do whatever. Your soils are gonna just keep accumulating, they're gonna hold on to that phosphorus, it's not going anywhere, all right? But now that we've learned a little more, now that the research has, it, has, has moved forward, we've realized that there are areas where no, that's not okay. Right? If you're over on the western shore or even up here on the northern shore and you've got heavier soils, more medium textures, more loam, the, the word sand isn't in your soil type at all, right? If you don't have the word sand in your soil type, you're probably okay. And you already have low phosphorus concentrations. You know, you haven't historically been applying manure. Yeah, that's okay. This is totally okay. Do it, right? Keep an eye on it, but this is okay. That pea's not going anywhere. All right, but we have learned that on sandy soils, or soils that already have high pea concentrations, that this is not okay, all right? And you're at a higher risk of losing that phosphorus eventually to the Chesapeake Bay, all right? So I like to share my favorite analogy. It's the glasses analogy. And I had a, I had a picture in here. I actually went to my cupboard and like I pulled out two glasses, took pictures of them, but it wasn't great. So I went to clip art instead, right? But what we've got here is kind of a, a taller skinny glass and one of those shorter kind of um, smaller, smaller glasses, all right? When we're talking about a medium textured soil, this is a soil that's going to have more clay. It's going to have a larger capacity to hold onto that P, all right? So I want you to think about a medium textured soil as this really kind of tall, large glass, all right? Versus our sandy soil, more sand, less clay. The clay is where all the action happens. This is where all the phosphorus is being held in your soil. So if you've got more sand and less clay, you've got to lower a smaller capacity to hold P. Your glass is a little bit smaller, all right? So just like when you have two different size glasses and you start filling them up with water, that smaller glass is going to fill up first, right? It's the same principle when we're talking about sandy soils versus heavier soils, all right? Those sandy, sandier soils are going to get to capacity. That cup is going to fill faster than our larger soils. I hope that's what I just said. Yes, that is what I just said, all right? Our sandier soils, those small cups are gonna reach saturation, are gonna fill to capacity quicker than our heavier soils. All right, so when we go back to this mismatched nutrient content, does that mean that we shouldn't at all be able to use the benefits of, wait, let me make sure that's, what, nope, that wasn't what I was gonna say. All right, so is this okay? Is applying this extra bit of phosphorus beyond crop needs, is that okay? Well, maybe for a year or two, all right? But years of application, 
all right, are really going to increase those soil pea concentrations. And we're seeing it. And we've seen it on certain areas of the state. I don't want to just say the short areas of the state where this has happened. All right. So what's the solution? Unfortunately, there's not much of a solution. All right. Some of the research that I did with, with Bob Cradville, and actually Bob Cradville and Frank Cole started these pl plots back in 1994. All right. 18 to 44 years for some of those soil, soil soils with high P concentrations to come back down to the point where you can use uh, poultry litter or you can apply phosphorus again, all right? 18 to 44 years. So if you're in this situation, I'm sorry. Hopefully by the end of my career, I'm hoping to have a better answer for you, but that's going to take a little time, so bear with me, all right? If you are not yet there, there are options for you. All right, use poultry litter and use it judiciously. I'm gonna talk about that here in a second. All right, so one of the options, don't use as much litter, right? Only apply as much poultry litter as what the phosphorus demand is of your crop is, okay? You can still reap the other benefits, the, in, in, uh, the introduction of organic matter, your pH benefits, the ammonia or the nitrogen available in that litter, all right? You can still reap those benefits, but you're just not going to put as much down, all right? So applying that poultry litter to meet the phosphorus demands of your crop. All right, so. Folks on the Eastern Shore and other parts of the states, but mostly on the Eastern Shore, where we have these high concentrations of phosphorus, these growers may have a limited use of poultry litter, all right? But there's really not any less litter being generated right now, right? We still have about the same amount, I'm sure, of litter being generated. So what does that mean? Well, after I talked about all these benefits and these different ways that this litter can be used, hopefully, although Jenny said she's not seeing it, and from folks I'm talking to, they're not seeing it either, but maybe at some point, there's gonna be litter available that can move to other parts of the state. And these benefits can be reaped by folks that did, have not traditionally used poultry litter as an amendment, all right? But are there concerns about this? Right? You don't have to answer me. It's more of a rhetorical question, just so I can make my next point. But if you're someone who hasn't been using poultry litter before in the past, right? maybe you're seeing some of this, you're, you're hearing some discussions, and you're thinking, well, why would I want to use that? Right? There's people that are now being told they're not allowed to use it. Why would I want to take that on? So I want to address some concerns, if there is anyone here. And, and again, I, I gave this talk out in Western Maryland, where there might be some folks who are more concerned about you know, transporting and taking on and using some of this manure. All right? So I'm just addressing kind of like the four or five that I could think of off the top of my head. But if you think there's any more, please come talk to me afterwards, because I'd be interested in incorporating some other potential concerns into this talk so we can address it and we can discuss it. All right? So what's the number one concern, right? Someone who's across the bridge, even someone who's here on the upper shore, it's like, how do I get that litter to my farm, right? How do I transport it there? How do I get it there? That's going to be expensive, and do I really want to incur that cost? Well, the Maryland Department of Agriculture has their manure transport uh, program, which I want to add, it's a state-funded program, but there's additional funds that come from the Delmarva Poultry Companies, the integrators. They feel that this is something important enough that they've invested money into as well, in addition to the money that comes from um, the state. And really, this program basically incentivizes moving poultry litter to other parts of the state. All right? And now... When I first gave this talk, when Jenny invited me to come give this talk, it was before, prior to this legislative session. I think it was last summer. And after multiple conversations that I've had with Secretary Bartenfelder, it seems like they've been putting a lot of effort and a lot of energy into really making sure that this is a successful program, that this is working successfully, expediting some of the processes. And I don't know if someone else from MDA is going to talk about this, so I'm sorry if I'm 
stealing what you were going to say, but I wanted to make the point that, you know, there have been complaints about the efficiency and the ability f uh, for the manure transport program to function in the past, and I think MDA has heard some of those complaints and is really trying to make an effort to, to work and make this program better. So if you were hesitant about utilizing this program before, I implore you to look into it again because there have been some updates and there have been some improvements. Um, and this number may not be correct anymore. Again, I said they've made some improvements. Up to $18 per ton. There is no limit on the cost share amount for poultry litter. So some of the other manures that are moved around, there's a cap. You can only um, get so much funding for moving those other types of manures. That cap does not exist for poultry litter. All right, major requirements for the receiving operation. Again, if folks already have low soil pea concentrations, they are the ones who are the most, who are going to benefit most from the addition of this poultry litter. So those soil pea concentrations of the receiving operation have to be lower than 150 FIV. All right, and as I mentioned, there's been additional updates in the in 2020 to increase efficiency and decrease some of the lag time uh, with the manure transport program. All right, some other thing I want some other things I want to point out again, folks that are not used to using manure or storing it or transporting it. Um, you just have to pay attention. I like to say you just have to use some common sense about where you're going to locate, especially if you're going to kind of site these, site a pile of manure kind of out in the field. We're not talking long-term storage. We're talking like now you're putting it out in the field because you're getting ready to use use it pretty pretty soon here. I've seen, as I run around Kent County, I've seen a lot of piles popping up where they weren't there the last time I ran down that road, all right? So again, just using common sense, we wanna minimize the risk of your nutrient loss as well as nuisance to neighbors. So just making sure you're paying attention to distance from uh, someone else's property, a spring well or wetland, um, as well as surface water or a ditch. So next to the ditch is not the right place to put this pile. Um, and if you are considering long-term storage of manure, um, like citing some type of a structure, just make sure you're paying attention to your individual county um, zoning. I won't throw any particular county under the bus, but there are some counties where the zoning distances from property border, even if you own the other property, if there is a property border, there's different setbacks in terms of manure storage. So again, just something to be paying attention to do. I'm not going to list them all. Just make sure you're paying attention to that. Okay, so hopefully I've addressed the concern about folks, well, how am I going to get that litter here? I don't have it. How am I going to get it here? All right? So preventing soil phosphorus concentrations from getting into that high or that very high category, all right? Should I be concerned about using poultry litter because in two years, all of a sudden, my uh, phosphorus concentrations are going to be high? No, you shouldn't be concerned. All right, as long as you are paying attention to your soil test report, I know we don't have a lab in Maryland anymore, so I had to go and use University of Delaware's report, all right, because they're the closest ones we've got. But as long as you are paying attention to your soil test report in conjunction with the folks who are working with you to write your nutrient management plan, all right, as long as you are paying attention, there shouldn't be any concern about your phosphorus concentrations getting high, all right. Nothing happens very quickly in soils, okay? So it's gonna take a long time for those phosphorus concentrations to come up. Just like I showed you that data that it's gonna take a long time for it to come back down, all right? So as long as you are monitoring, as long as you're paying attention to your soil test report, shouldn't be a problem, all right? If you're concerned, if you're concerned because over a period of some time, you see that phosphorus concentration creeping up, rotate that poultry litter to another field, all right? Just put it on a different field. That nothing's happening fast, as long as you're paying attention to it. Okay, what about applications on slope landscapes, right? We're all paying attention to nutrient management. We're all paying attention to our nutrient application, all right? So, just as though we have the ability to inject some of our more liquid manures, right? So, for those of you who can't see this picture or haven't seen this, this implement actually, um, it has tines on the front. It will actually go underneath the ground and the liquid manure will be pumped through these tubes. 
and the manure will actually be put, placed under the soil surface. This is a really great option, I mean, in general, but a really great option on sloped landscapes where we've that, got that concern for surface runoff or erosion of that um, litter or manure that you're applying, literally it rolling right off the slopes. Again, I know that's not a major concern on, in this area, but something I want to point out. All right. There has been work. I think it's kind of slowed down a little bit in the past years as we realized um, this type of machine wasn't really going to work. But there are ag engineers out at other schools that have ag engineering programs, not University of Maryland, all right, that are working on this idea of taking the principles of subsurface liquid manure injection and being able to utilize that with, with drier manures like poultry litter. And so those of you guys who um, did any work with uh, Josh McGrath ba back in, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, 15, all right, we were testing a prototype of the poultry litter subsurfer. It was basically like a glorified planter, and it took that manure and it put it under the soil surface. So I'm not saying this is ready for prime time. I don't even know that there's any of them left in the country that work because I think Josh broke them all. But it, I think, but the point I want to make is that there is research going into this idea of how do we take this principle of subsurface liquid injection and, and bring it to um, the dry manures as well. All right, quality of product, right? If you're not used to using manure and you're concerned about using it, you know, what kind of product am I going to get? You know, I, I want to make the point that manure testing is required as part of your nutrient management plan, that manure has to be tested, that test has to be included in your plan. You should be able to obtain this test from the seller of your manure or the broker, whoever you're getting it from. So there shouldn't be concerns over quality of the product because you will get basically an analysis that comes along with that product. Oh good, I'm almost done. All right, so other concerns that I kind of came up with um, as my final bullet, right? Availability, we discussed that, and, and Jenny mentioned it, that you know she's not even really able to see it and get it from anywhere. Yeah, that's a, that's a major concern. I don't have a solution for that. I'm just simply pointing out that it may be a concern. Is there even manure available? Um, do we have the right equipment to be able to apply it? Does somebody I know have the right equipment to be able to apply it? Yeah, that's a major concern. If you're not used to using this type of material, you may not have um, the equipment available to spread it. Cost, right? Yeah. I've heard so many different prices from different people just in my kind of um, casually surveying folks of, of how much they pay or, or what's available to them. So yeah, that's definitely going to be a question mark. I don't know that they're I don't know that I have a good answer for it, but it's just a concern that I think some folks may may have in the future, all right, for using poultry litter. So I want to wrap this up. And hopefully I'll leave some good time for sponsors to introduce themselves. So the point I wanted to drive home is that poultry litter provides slow release source of nutrients. It increases the health of your soil by keeping your, um, keeping your pH in the optimum range, adding that organic matter, acting like a sponge, and, and really helping the ecosystem of your soil. All right, there is a potential risk of increasing your soil pea concentrations, but this can be managed through the judicious use of this product. All right, concerns about increasing your soil pea should not prohibit the use of poultry litter. All right, we just have to pay attention and we just have to do it the right way. All right, and there are resources available through MDA to incentivize the transport, transportation of this material to other parts of the state. So I implore you to look into that. This is not a cost that you have to, to bear on your own, okay? There's resources and there's money potentially available for that. All right, so with that, I'm happy to take um, any questions. I will be here all day. I'm coming back right before lunch to give another talk. So if you want to chat with me during the break, I'm happy to chat about that too. Any, any questions? questions? Thank you, Jenny. Um, it's a great program you're putting on here. Nicole, um, you gave me a flashback, and you talked about 1994, those uh, manure plots were put out. Well, uh, a very young Mark Saltonfuss and Frank Cole and uh, Ted Haas, we, we spent our, about three days putting that manure out. So I, was, uh, I wasn't gray, and I had a lot more hair then, you know. But uh, thank you for doing that. Um, this is, the, this is the, the 
fourth meeting I've been to this week, and uh, um, I'm starting to get meeting out like everybody else here. But you know, um, one of the best talks I heard this week was at Steve Freeman's uh, uh, meeting, and a gentleman, um, uh, Mr. Haynes uh, from Middletown, Maryland, he was talking about 462 bushels of corn that he grew this past year, and um, you know he had a a 25 or 30 year old John Deere stock corn planter uh, with dry fertilizer on it, no bells or whistles. He used, uh, I think his marker was a, a chain. And if you guys are, um, if you guys are under 50 years old, you don't know what I mean by using a chain for a marker. But um, anyway, but his his uh, operation was built on uh, following the basics, like the old uh, baseball coach what said, you know, just stick to the basics. Uh, don't for, don't worry about the bells and whistles if you if you don't have the basics right, and that's what he did. And um, you know how he pulled it off. He paid a whole lot of attention to the basics of his fertility program, and what was underneath that corn. And I, I want to talk about that with uh, commodity prices taking a nosedive. I mean, a really serious nosedive in the past couple of days. The only thing good I can say about it is that it happened towards the end of the price discovery period for projected prices. Had this happened a month ago, it would have been really, really, really ugly. Um, so your looks like the projected prices for corn is going to come in about three dollars and eighty-nine cents a bushel, and for beans about nine twenty-two. And that's uh, that's that's the foundation. That is what's under, underneath your your crop insurance. So in the essence of keeping back to basics. I would really focus on your crop insurance. Uh, look at what, how that can mitigate some of these uh, prices that are that aren't not forecast to improve with 95 or 100 million acres of corn being planted this year. Uh, it's going to put a lot of pressure on the prices. Besides the coronavirus, besides politics, besides you know world world situations. So um, first of all, look at your crop insurance policy. Look at it really good and make sure that. Everything on the front page, the declarations page, is right. Your, your entity hasn't changed. Uh, your marital status hasn't changed. Your SBIs in your LLCs or your inks haven't changed. Just pay attention to those basics and then look at how you can use that policy and girdle up the safety net on your crop insurance. If anybody has any questions, there's, uh, there's other crop insurance agents here. They're very, they're very competent people. Uh, reach out to one of us and, and talk to us about that. But thank you very much. Oh, good. Thank you. My name is Kevin Dean. I'm with Valent USA. Uh, appreciate all your business over the years. And uh, just had a couple comments, uh, some of our products in relation to uh, Kurt's presentation to start the day today. We make uh, Valor and Fierce herbicides, great products for soybeans. We was talking about his uh, programs as far as weed management, weed resistance. Uh, they both fit in great in far as that goes here with the weed spectrum that we have problems with in this area. And he talked about multiple modes of action. Uh, just highlight one of our products with three modes of action, which is Fierce MTZ. So you have the, the Power of Valor, you've got Zidua, and also you have uh, Metribuzin all in one jug. Uh, and they does a good job on all, three of the key pro, uh, weeds he was talking about today in terms of mare's tail, Palmer amaranth, and also common ragweed. So one to keep in mind for your plans this year. And just in case you don't kill everything with your pre-program, we do sell Cobra that he mentioned does a good job, uh, excellent burn down product for uh, particularly common ragweed problems. And one of the comments that, uh, that Kurt mentioned in terms of potential new ways of uh, addressing is those of you particularly with uh, been in no-till over the years thinking about, well, maybe I'll try this deep tillage uh, once every little while, every three, four years. And we have uh, products that uh, could help restore some soil health and soil structure if that's one of the actions that you choose because we know that part of the reason you're using uh, no-till is just to improve your soil health and your productivity. But uh, if you have to go and, and work that ground up, uh, we have a product called Endoprime, labeled for corn, 
couple other different products in that same family. It's uh, made up of three mycorrhizae fungi, so it uh, works on soil health and then also helps improve the, the structure of your soil if you've had to disturb things. So something to think about. If you have some questions, please stop by and uh, wish you well this year. Take care. Thank you. Just wanted to say hi to everybody. I'm Katie with Sunrise Solar. Um, we do solar panels to help you know, negate that electric bill that you guys are paying every month. Um, we can do panels on your barns. We can do ground mounts if that's what you're looking for. Um, and you know, there's lots of ways to pay for it. You know, of course, you're you're getting rid of your electric bill, but there's lots of grants and incentives out there to help, you know, offset that cost of solar so that you guys can get started with it. And it does really helps you guys levelize the cost. It protects you against the inflation. And it also will, you know, you're not fluctuating your bill every month, so it stabilizes it, and it has a great return on, on your profit. So, um, you know, if anybody's interested in looking at what solar can do for them, um, just give me a call. Thanks. <laughs>